The aim of ISO 9001 was to enhance the world trade and developed during European common market era. Business leaders throughout the world brainstormed the idea in 1980 to determine best business practices and requirements for each such practice to ensure consistent and conforming output of goods and services. The idea was to expect equal treatment in managing everything from new orders to customer complaints in the companies worked in the same space. All standards define an ideal state within which people, and indeed entire societies, work cooperatively, ever mindful of the best interests of all. ISO 9001, by recognizing the ideal state established the concept of continuous improvement to guide and motivate organizations to advance and succeed. ISO 9001 requires organizations to analyze their current state of affairs, define and set goals to achieve future expectations, and then monitor progress toward those goals. Top management, which is responsible for defining these goals, is therefore need feedback to determine how best to distribute resources. Those departments or processes that are most challenged become candidates for receiving additional resources. ISO 9001 defines all these interrelationships, some of which also require records to prove that decisions were developed and implemented based on facts, not assumptions. Metrics are established to monitor progress. When it becomes clear that metrics are below expectations, additional resources are provided to improve performance. Finally, those same metrics are used to determine the return on investment for those additional resources. Through this activity, the company becomes an improvement engine. Assuming that the marketplace incorporated and supported the outcome of all this effort, the obvious result should be sustained success, that is, a win-win scenario for both the organization and its customers. ISO 9001 is way of doing good business on several levels, but it offers proof of performance and therefore accountability at all operational levels. Businesses and business leaders are accountable to any number of internal and external demands. For example, shareholders want improved earnings, while the accounting department is clearly correct in submitting a costly requisition for new enterprise resource planning ERP, software. Customers, though not willing to pay more for it, are increasingly interested in additional software functionality, even though the design team needed to accomplish the upgrade is currently cost prohibitive. These and similar scenarios are commonplace in today's market. ISO 9001 offers a reliable set of methodologies for managing these kinds of countervailing demands. Of course, once the plan is established, the work must then be done. Performance that meets its goals becomes important within the organization. Expectations are defined and progress is monitored. The overall result is a new level of accountability, involvement, and visibility traditional top management oversight it captured through analysis of monthly financial statements. If the numbers are good, especially the bottom line, further action is less important than would be the case if profitability was reported to be under projections. But where, exactly, is the problem? Can financial statements alone provide the right answers? In many respects they can, especially if the question is directed to which losses occurred and where they happened. But financials alone do a relatively poor job of answering why and who was responsible for the loss. At best, they are the starting point for further inquiry. Without high-level objectives and department-level goals to achieve them, and without a clear and convincing vision of the future state, ailing performance often skips wildly, from month to month, from one area of the company to another. Without mutually agreed, high-level goals, the company is a rudderless ship, and behaves like one. Although the captain may want to achieve maximum speed, the crew can, and often does, cite the weather or excessive sea conditions for poor progress. It is also clear that one function, one type of activity that's controlled by the crew, can rarely make any real difference, given the lack of a deep and solid rudder under the ship. And so it goes, month to month, swaying with each variable breeze and hoping for success. The shipping company's financials simply report that income is down. Not that any particular vessel is late to unload its cargo. Businesses are not static which means their products and services are always changes with marketplace. Competitors are constantly eager to improve their bottom line through any number of advances within your own organization's existing customer base. Innovation is continuous activity which becomes the threat, 
It is the new constant in business worldwide, announced through the internet and the general media at the speed of light. Innovation is especially friendly to startups, which are eager to gain a toehold or to catapult their companies to mega status through one or more new approaches to an existing model. Large firms often fall victim to smaller firms as they become comfortable with established sales volumes and less concerned with their ability to remain profitable. Market innovators often target companies such as these, applying their best designers in the quest to outperform the current players whose research and development, R&D, investments have slackened over the years. It is important to note, however, that such efforts are highly focused and deliberate. Dot. Smaller businesses cannot afford extended R&D projects, cost overruns, and missed launch dates. They are small in number and at the mercy of limited supplies of capital and nervous investors. Time to market is critical not only to protect their ideas, but to stay in business at all. For these nascent organizations to succeed, it becomes crucial to produce. For those individuals working in these companies, risk and reward are high, but they are also the very reason why work is exciting and fun. The atmosphere is charged, and communication is immediate as everyone works to achieve the same outcome. ISO 9001's approach to innovation lies at the center point between the startup and the established company's approach. Remembering that fearlessness is just one step away from recklessness, ISO 9001's design requirements maintain proven risk mitigation criteria while allowing companies to move in any direction they believe to be appropriate. ISO is not restrictive in regard to innovation, but rather responsible. The key to successful design, to any innovation, for that matter, is to define new product expectations, features, and complexities. These are important to achieve focus and clarity as the work progresses. They keep the design team on track. Once the particulars are understood by the team, it is necessary to research any number of resulting requirements such as applicable legal issues standards, or codes to ensure that the market can adopt the product with the assurance that it is free of any unanticipated shortcomings. Controls are defined to ensure that as a product is developed, several go-slash-no-go sessions are planned to assess the product's ability to provide its originally intended design features. Once things are close to completion, two types of specialized controls are employed, verification and validation. Verification seeks to determine that what's on the print is what was produced. Validation ascertains whether what was produced actually works in the marketplace. Both considerations are extremely important, and validation is especially critical from the perspective of the consumer. A solid design program is careful to spend time researching and interacting with the market prior to launch, if only to determine whether the color is right and the consumer is not irritated by the soundtrack while waiting for an operator. Dot. The point of this discussion of innovation and ISO 9001 is to emphasize that both the established company and the innovator are equally supported by ISO 9001's design requirements, and that neither is restricted by them. In fact, the startup may need ISO 9001 far more than the established company so that it can avoid the potential for costly emissions in its design. The established company can benefit from ISO 9001's initial design planning requirements to avoid design creep and cost overruns. Both types of organizations can use ISO 9001's design requirements to better plan and support their design processes, create new products that are embraced by the marketplace, and avoid excessive risk in the launch of new products and processes for managing their services. It was once standard practice for large organizations to help their suppliers develop ever higher levels of sophistication in quality, supplier management, and logistics. Supplier quality engineers, SQEs, were tasked with analyzing the supplier base and offering training and other direct help to targeted suppliers to improve their performance and maintain costs. Today, few offer this kind of support. As the price to do so has increased, specialists have taken the place of many former multitasking operations. In addition, the rise of ISO 9001 acceptance has largely transferred managerial oversight to ISO 9001's third-party auditor. As a result, the majority of ISO 9001 registered companies now also require ISO 9001 registration of their suppliers. It's far less expensive to require oversight than to provide it.
Small businesses constitute the majority of organizations currently registered for ISO 9001. With more than 1 million registrations currently in place, it's also clear that many of these small organizations are registered because of requirements imposed by their larger customers. The call to be 9001 registered by these larger clients is primarily driven by the cost of maintaining a large staff of SQEs, many have chosen to instead rely on third-party auditors to ensure compliance and related satisfactory outcomes of the audit process. For most small businesses, the requirement to register is often perceived as a tax on business. Given that these organizations are currently successful in selling and gaining acceptance of their products, what can ISO 9001 add that isn't already in place? The answer is little more than restating the requirement that all suppliers be registered, the perception of ISO as little more than a tax, an additional fee imposed to remain or become a supplier. Indeed, the majority of registrants did so because they had to, not because they wanted to. In turn, many approach the registration process as a min for max proposition, spending the least amount possible to gain registration and hoping that the net outcome will not excessively hinder their current practices. This is especially true in terms of maintaining their ability to be flexible and responsive to their customers. ISO 9001 is often incorrectly perceived as a system that slows down operations with additional forms and paperwork, takes more time to develop concepts into finished products, sets up a new layer of bureaucracy through which many decisions and controls have to undergo new and confusing scrutiny, and simply costs more money than it's worth. None of these assumptions need be true, but all have the ability to become so, especially if the min for max approach is utilized. Unfortunately, it is easier and faster to overlay a pattern of acceptability and compliance through methods that are favorable to the third-party auditor rather than addressing the improvement needs of the company seeking registration. The Minformax approach intensively relies on documentation, forms, and reports to provide evidence of compliance to the standard. It can be, and often is, available as a package of materials requiring some basic editing to indicate relevance to the company and its practices along with appropriate training of a select few who have been charged with developing the program. It also sets in place most of the negative perceptions of ISO 9001 as a tax on business because the goal is tactical, registration as a business requirement, rather than strategic, registration to improve business practices and performance. As a result, the company develops work instructions instead of its workforce, produces reports that satisfy specific clauses within the standard instead of specific needs, and compiles documentation structured to convey permanence and authority instead of clarity and understanding. The call to register to the standard is strong within the marketplace. Organizations face a choice, do they undertake study and planning for implementation that first and foremost enables and improves? or do they throw together a string of documented evidence primarily relevant to achieving registration? Even if the initial belief of top management is that ISO 9001 is a tax on business, there is much to recommend in the adage, if all you have are lemons, make lemonade. The strategic approach allows the company to ride atop the wave, or at least seize the opportunity to develop a clear path to doing so, while the tactical approach most often leads organizations to become consumed by it. Developing your quality management system, whether it be a new registration or an upgrade from the 2008 revision, is a strategic decision, one that will affect the working lives of everyone in your company. We believe that there is opportunity in the making. The following chapters were developed to define the reasons, methods, and possible tools to achieve initial registration or upgrade to the 2015 revision of ISO 9001 that add value to your business. The 2015 revision is the culmination of many years of development and worldwide acceptance. Chapter 2 examines that history a bit further and explicates the differences between the 2008 release and the 2015 revision. As you continue reading, keep in mind that the intent of the ISO 9001 standard is to enable best practices, not to restrict them. Even though you may be compelled to register by customer demands, it's infinitely better to adopt the position that the organization was instead given the opportunity to improve, 